higher derivatives is what I want to talk about. Um, you know, we've been talking about the derivatives for quite some time. Actually, what we've been doing is actually called, sometimes called the first derivative to distinguish it from the higher derivatives, which would be the second derivative, the third derivative, etc. cetera. Um, they're not very hard to do. Uh, let's just, I think we can just do an example here. Let's say I begin with something like x to the 4 plus 3x cubed minus 7x squared minus 5. How about that? What is the derivative? It, this is easy, right? 4x cubed plus 9x squared minus 14x. And then that goes away. This is the first derivative. What's the second derivative? The second derivative is when you take the derivative of this one. All right. So the derivative of the derivative, you write that like this. F double prime is 12x squared plus 18x minus 14 in this case. All right. That's called the second derivative. That's it. That's what the higher derivatives are. What's the third derivative? It's you take the derivative again. What's it going to be? 36 x plus 18, right? This is how you do the higher derivative. Um, is there such a thing as the fourth derivative? Yeah, there is. You can do this as many times as you want, right? Um, people, just the notation, people don't like writing a whole bunch of primes. It's kind of a pain to count them all up. So typically after, say, the, the third derivative, you start writing them like this. This is the fourth derivative inside the little parentheses. Um, you put the parentheses to mean the fourth derivative. Without the parentheses, it looks like f to the fourth, which is not what you mean. Uh, anyway, that would be 36. And then you could actually take the derivative one more time and you get zero. And then all the rest of them would be zero. If, if you take the derivative over and over again of zero, you get zero. These are the higher derivatives. So what I want to talk about today is um, why you would want to do this, what these things actually represent. It turns out they are actually quite useful. Okay, what do the higher derivatives actually represent? The, the, the uh, second derivative um, is something that actually you encounter fairly often in the real world. The third, less so. The fourth and higher, you pretty much don't, um, you don't, you, you have to be fairly obscure situations in order to make use of those. But the second derivative is quite useful. Um, let's just talk about what it means. So remember the first derivative is the rate of change of the original function. This is useful all the time. If you want to know wh uh, whether something is increasing or decreasing, you look at the first derivative. You want to know how quickly something is changing, which that question comes up all the time in all kinds of situations. You use the derivative. All right. What is the second derivative? Well, you can say it in the same way. It's the rate of change Of, but it's, it's not the rate of change of the original function. It's the rate of change of this one because you started with this one and you took the derivative. So it's the rate of change of f prime of x. How quickly f prime of x is changing? That It's sort of like the rate of the rate, right? How fast this rate of change is itself changing. It seems a little weird and a little obscure, but actually this is a very common thing that you encounter um, fairly often. For instance, in physics, if you have something like f of t, where t, t is time and f of t is the position of something, what is the derivative? That would be how quickly the position is changing. But there's a word for that in physics. How fast the location of something is changing is um, the velocity or the speed, right? The, ve the velocity, if you include minus, plus and minus signs. So this is the velocity. If I have a function that tells you where something is at various points in time and you take the derivative, that would be how fast is the location changing, which if you think for a moment is the same as how fast is it moving. All right, that's the velocity. What would this be then, the second derivative? This is how fast is the velocity changing? And we also have a word for that in physics and in just ordinary life. This is called the acceleration. How fast? is the velocity changing. So everybody's familiar with acceleration. This is something that actually comes up a lot in the real world. All right. Um, in physics, actually, the third derivative also has a meaning. It's a little bit more obscure. There's a name for this. This is called the jerk. 
I'm not making this up. This is called the jerk. It's how fast the acceleration is changing. Um, the reason this is called the jerk is because, you know, when, um, when you're, say, sitting in a car or something, you actually can't perceive directly velocity in terms of uh, your, uh, your senses, right? You, I suppose you can look out the window and see how fast stuff is going. But um, if there were no windows or anything, you really, you can't tell how fast the car is moving because there are no forces acting on your body. Acceleration, though, you can feel. If the car accelerates, you do this. And if the car decelerates, like hits the brakes, you do this, right? Um, so acceleration, when you do this in your seat, you are feeling the effects of the second derivative, all right? Jerk, that would be if the acceleration is itself changing rapidly, which is to say you have some sort of rapid acceleration followed by a rapid deceleration and those um acceleration is changing like crazy then what uh, what do you look like if you are experiencing a lot of change in the acceleration you're doing this right that's why it's called the jerk because you look like a jerk when you do that um so like there's something called whiplash this is a injury you get if somebody uh, if you slam into something in your car and then something hits you from behind, you'll do this. And then this whiplash is not caused by acceleration. It's actually it's caused by jerk. Okay, so this is what the derivatives mean in physics. The second derivative uh, is, is considerably more common to make use of than the third derivative. Um, I actually encountered the second derivative when I was in college one year. At the end of the year, we, um, we got a letter in our mailbox about the tuition rate for the, the following year. And the letter said, hey, we got some good news for you. Um, the tuition this year will be increasing, unfortunately, but the rate at which the tuition is increasing has decreased. You get that? What they meant was, you know, last year it increased a lot. This year it, it's still going to increase, but it's going to increase uh, less. Uh, really, so the fact that it's increasing, they're saying the first derivative is positive. That's what increasing means but they are saying also the increase has decreased that is to say the rate of increase has decreased which is to say the second derivative um, is negative all right so they, that that whole letter was actually a description of the second derivative there were a lot of words in there they could have just said the first derivative is positive but the second derivative is negative that's what they were trying to tell us all right before we go any further we should talk about just a couple other notations for the higher derivatives, you know, the first derivative you can write like this, f prime of x. You can also write this way, dy dx. Usually I write it this way, but this is also a common way of writing the first derivative, okay? How do you write the, you know, the second derivative? You do this. Um, well, how do you write it in this style? There's a, there's a way of writing the second derivative in this style. This is sort of the notation that was developed by uh, Leibniz, one of the founders of calculus, whereas this is more of a Newton style notation. Um, anyway, the second derivative you write this way, d squared y dx squared. This is a little weird. Why does the square go on the d rather than on the uh, on the x squared? I don't really care about that. Um, it has to do with the fact that, you know, the derivative just by itself, this is the operation which means the derivative. So what do you, uh, how would you write, if you do that twice, well then you get uh, like, this, right, which you would write as two d's on top, two dx's on the bottom, but only one y. It's a little weird, but anyway, that's how we do it. Um, the higher derivatives, you know, f, the nth derivative, you would write this way, the nth derivative in this way would be written like this. All right, uh, you, like I said, usually I'm going to write it this way. Sometimes you'll see it written this way. They mean the same thing. Not a big deal. Graphically, how do you see the second derivative on a graph? Um, you know, all along we've been talking about the first derivative. You can see the first derivative on a graph because the derivative is the slope of the graph, all right? So if I draw you a picture, it's easy for you to tell me immediately just by looking at the picture where, for instance, is the slope positive, where is it negative? Can you do that with the second derivative? Actually, yes, you can if you know what you're looking for. Um, what does the second derivative look like on a graph? Well, let me just remind you, f prime of x, the first derivative, is the slope. I just said that. And f double prime of x is the rate of change of the slope. I'm going to write it this way. Um, how the slope is changing. All right? For example, very specifically, what does it mean if I say f double prime of x is positive? 
that means the slope of the graph is increasing. It means slope is increasing, all right? And similarly, if the second derivative is negative, it means the slope is decreasing, okay? And this is something you can actually see on the picture. You look at the slopes as you move across the graph and you ask yourself, are these slopes increasing or are the slopes decreasing? And you can tell by looking at the picture, it's not hard. Here, let's just look at some examples. Okay, so the second derivative being positive, this looks like, remember the situation you're describing here is the slope of the graph is increasing as you move across to the right. It looks something like this. This is a typical example where over here on the left, you see um, slope is close to zero and it increases throughout, all right? This is a picture in which the second derivative is positive throughout the whole picture. Or it doesn't uh, have to look like that. It could also look something like this. Here, the slope is also increasing. You have to remember the signs, right? Here, this, uh, in this portion, the slope is negative, but fairly steep, and then it becomes close to zero. That is an increase, right? Something which is starting off negative and then becoming zero, that is an increase, okay? So both of these pictures have increasing slopes, which is to say the second derivative is positive. Another uh, way to do that would be just like this. That's kind of a combination if you sort of glue these together. All right, throughout the whole picture here, the second derivative is positive, okay? All of these pictures, we use uh, sort of the geometric word to describe what you see here. These are all, we would refer to them as concave up, all right? Up meaning, I, I think the easiest way to remember sort of the difference between concave up versus concave down is this, this kind of picture, right? Up, the, uh, the face goes up like that. A little smiley. Isn't that cute? Anyway, this is called concave up, all right, when the second derivative is positive. And you can look at a graph and you can tell. Just does it have this kind of a shape to it? In that case, the second derivative is positive. Okay, what does it look like when the second derivative is negative? All right, the second derivative being negative, uh, that's called concave down. What does that look like? Well, here's an example where the second derivative is negative, something like that. Here you see the slope is positive and becoming zero. That is to say the slope is decreasing. Or it can look like this. Starts off being like zero, but then becomes negative. This is a decreasing slope. Uh, or it could look like sort of those two stuck together, like that, all right? All of these pictures have the second derivative being negative. It's called concave down, and it looks like that, right? Okay, concave up versus concave down. It's about the, uh, it's not exactly the slope, but it's how the slope is changing over time. Basically, is it like that or like that? Concave up, concave down. Typically, a graph will have some mixture of both. Usually, it's not always concave up or always concave down. It's usually sometimes concave up, sometimes concave down. Here's, um, here's an example. Let's say you got something like that, where I'm gonna mark off that point, that point, all right? Now, um, in other examples that we've looked at so far, we have focused on the critical numbers, which would have been these three points. Those are the relative uh, extrema in this example, that's uh, these two are relative maximum, this is the relative minimum. Let's talk about the concavity though, which is uh, different and you actually want to focus on some different points. Although I hope you can agree just um, without knowing much about where we're going with this, there's some regions here which are concave up and some which are concave down. For example, over here, does that look any different to you? That's yellow, this is green. Let's try this one. Yeah, that's better. Over here, the thing is concave down because it's the frowny shape, all right? Also over here, it's concave down. Notice I'm, I'm continuing a little past these points, right? It continues to be this frowny shape, even past this point, right? It's down. Whereas in the middle, it's concave up. It's got the smiley shape. Um, I'll do it like this, all right? So there are some regions where it's concave down and some regions where it's concave up. And there are certain points where the concavity switches. 
say right around there, you, you can't be too precise about this, but I'm just, I'm just sort of estimating a little bit. Right around there is where the concavity switches from being down over here to up over here. And similarly, there's a point right around here where the concavity switches, here it's down, here it's up, all right? Anyway, having found those points, we can say exactly where the function is concave up or concave down in terms of intervals. F is concave up on the interval, uh, this would be two to four, all right? And concave down on the interval over here, minus infinity to two and four to infinity. All right, it's a very similar question. You know, we used to do things like, tell me where is the function increasing or decreasing? Give me intervals. All right, same idea, only instead of increasing, decreasing, I'm talking about concavity this time. Okay, th these special points here, these are points where the concavity switches. They have an important role when you're talking about the second derivative, uh, much like the critical numbers have an important role when you're talking about the first derivative. These kinds of points um, are important when you're talking about the second derivative. They are called inflection points. All right, inflection points are points where the concavity switches. Like here, it's concave down and then it becomes concave up. Here it's concave up and then it becomes concave down. Those are called inflection points.